<laughs> How's everyone doing this morning? Doing well? Doing well? Is everybody warm enough? Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to shut the door. I think it's going to warm up. Okay. We don't need to Just go ahead. Yeah, we're shutting it off. There you go. That way the camera won't pick up the low um, rumble of the, yeah. And it won't pick up the, you know, as everybody starts fanning here a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we had um, the heater that functions this room and the library has a part that has gone out. And they could have overnighted it, but it would have gotten here at 10 o'clock today. And I told them, well, that was a little bit late. So they're going to fix it tomorrow. So this vaccine is coming in. Okay. If you want to be opening your Bibles to the book of Daniel, we are in chapter 3. And we left off last week right around verse 19. We'll back up just a moment and um, read a little bit to remind ourselves of where we're at. There we go. As a matter of fact, we'll back up to verse to verse, to verse 13 and just kind of read a little bit. Kind of lay the groundwork. It's good to see everyone here today. We have a nearly a full house so it's good to have we have several who haven't been here before and it's great to have y'all with us and um, others who were out of town last week won't mention their name but it's good to have them back as well and <laughs> judy feeling better and so all right before we begin with our bible study today let's go to our heavenly father in the word of prayer and brother dan would you mind leading our minds in that prayer our father in heaven we thank you so much for all the very many blessings that we receive from thee and we thank thee for this great country we live in and the opportunity that we have this morning to come together and study from thy word. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will be able to uh, glean some important things from uh, thy prophet Daniel and, and learn from him how we need to uh, live our life to serve thee better. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with those of our number who are undergoing medical procedures at this time. And, uh, we especially pray at this time for uh, Brother Lansing as, as he is taking uh, his treatments for his cancer. We pray that he'll be completely uh, cured of uh, this ailment and he'll be able to have a long and lasting uh, service to thee as a member <coughs> of this local congregation. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with those others of our number who are sick and restore them to their health also. We'd ask you to be with us now as we study from my word and, and uh, help us to go boldly out into the neighborhoods around us and into this nation and carry thy word to people who are lost. We pray that you'll be merciful unto us, Heavenly Father, and forgive us when we repent of the things that we leave undone that we need to do. And we ask for thy forgiveness for the things that we do that are against thy will. And uh, we... We come before thee this morning, Heavenly Father, through thy Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we pray these things. Amen. 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 All right, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's back up to verse 13 of Daniel 3, and I'll read here for just a little bit to bring us up to speed. Uh, what was it that Nebuchadnezzar here had built? Yeah, he built a statue. And it was according to, if, if you convert cubics to feet, it was about 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. So as far as the, the overall dimensions of it. And uh, we did a lot of speculating as to exactly what it looked like. And there's no way of telling other than the fact it was, had gold on it. Um, it was pointed out that a solid gold statue 90 feet high and 9 feet wide would probably have been too heavy for them to have constructed. But, but the, we speculate that it was probably a pedestal, if you would, the majority of the way, and then a statue up on top. And the statue, the top may have been gold or covered with gold or something. But anyway, the point is Nebuchadnezzar had erected it. And what did he command the people to do regarding that statue? Bow down to it. Bow down to it. Yeah, when they heard the music play, essentially, they were to bow down and to worship that statue. Well... As, it, as the story goes, we read here, there's some Chaldeans, or Chaldeans, who um, got upset because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not bowing down to worship. 
And so they bring the message to Nebuchadnezzar about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not worshiping the statue. So they brought them there before the king. So let's start reading verse 14, where Nebuchadnezzar spoke. And let me switch this. There we go. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time, you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made. Good. But if you do not worship, you shall be immediately cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? And then we observe their reply in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Now, a couple small little observations here before we get into where we had left off last week. Um, one of the things that I find interesting is that Nebuchadnezzar, he had, at least there had been, Daniel had proven to Nebuchadnezzar the existence of the, the, the God of the Jews with the interpretation of the dream. And so Nebuchadnezzar knew beyond a shadow of doubt that at least the Jews' God was the, the greatest of the gods. Okay? Bear, bear in mind, he was still a polytheistic king. They, his nation still worshipped multiple gods. And the God of the Jews was just one more God for them to worship. But Daniel in the display there had elevated the God of the Jews in the mind of um, Nebuchadnezzar. So with Nebuchadnezzar, it was proof, proof, the, as we say, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak, that once he saw the great feet, he at least believed in Daniel's God. What I find interesting about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and more in regards to their reply, and let me draw your attention back to that here. They essentially say that, he says, if that is the case, that is, if we're thrown into the fire, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, look at the next one, verse 18. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. What is interesting, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego believed that God could save them. But in the event that God didn't save them, they still weren't going to bow because they already what? They already believed. You know? It was God's choice whether or not God wanted to save them. And if God chose not to save them, it still wouldn't affect their belief. It wouldn't alter the way they thought about God. They still would not bow down and worship the king. Any thoughts about that? It's kind of interesting, too, how short of memory and never did Yes. So you recognize the superiority of God when God revealed to Daniel the dream and the interpretation of it, but you've got a short memory. Yes. And, uh, so, uh, you know, that's, we, we'll forget all of that, and now you need to bow down to what I've built out here and worship it. Uh, so he, he did remember the miracle that was performed in the, in the person of, Dave, of Daniel's interpretation of his dream, uh, which is not uncharacteristic of, of the Jews, for example, throughout all their history. That's true. Oftentimes they would forget. Yeah. yeah. Well, you look back at uh, mm -hmm. oh, the latter part of Joshua, where they said, you know, we will always serve Jehovah. Right. I promise you, we'll always serve Jehovah. And in Judges' second chapter, in two generations, they forgot him. Exactly. The generation came up, they didn't know Joshua and the men of that time, and they, that's right. Well, how long was it in between the crossing of the Red Sea and the crossing of the Jordan? When they were balking at the crossing of the Jordan? Forty years, wasn't it? Forty years, yeah. Forty years. They, and they'd already forgotten that he parted the Red Sea for them, and now they come up against a, 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 a flooding river. Yeah. And their faith was shaken again. <laughs> kind of like, what are you doing on the leg with it? Yeah. yeah. Well, and it was just days after they were in the wilderness that they began to mumble. Right, exactly. Yeah. Grumble and mumble. <laughs> the death of the firstborn. They forgot uh -huh. that 
en route to the Red Sea. Yeah. Well, that's right. Ten, they right. tend to forget. Yeah. Miss Pat. Pat. Maybe uh, Nebuchadnezzar just thought because he believed in multiple gods that they should too, which they wouldn't believe except in God. Well, let's think about something for just a moment, maybe maybe from his perspective. That's right. I mean, his perspective, he yeah. thought this is okay because I believe in multiple <coughs> gods. But he didn't understand the God of heaven that the Jews worship. Right. And I, I wonder if the only message he got from the whole dream is that, hey, you're the best of the kings, you know. And apparently I'm favored by the, by, by the, he, by the Jews' gods or the Hebrews' gods because he's going to let me reign supreme. You know, and so maybe he let that go to his head. And so he's saying, well, naturally, if your God favors me and I build a statue and tell you to worship it, you got to worship it. I'm speculating, obviously, here on what he might have been thinking. Let's go to Rodney and then Dan. I think, though, just based upon verse 16, that he knew better than what he was asking him to do because he, they say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. In other words, you already know the answer, Nebuchadnezzar. You're asking us to do something against the God of could be. Yeah, Could so be. I think he and remember, Daniel was still by his side. You know, and, and we don't, as we said last week, we don't know how long this was from the time of the dream, you know, onward. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king in the court. And um, so he, he may not have been fully ignorant of, of their beliefs. But to him, it seemed very reasonable for them to worship his gods or his God there. Dan. I didn't have any. Wow. Believe it or not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder, though, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar has already acknowledged that uh, God is superior to all of his gods. Okay? He's created an image here, though, and he never calls it a god. No. Nor do they call it a god. I wonder if it's a situation where he really wants to exert his power to get them to worship an image, in essence, worship him. I think so. I think, I think that's where he was heading with this. And if that's the case, then all the more then why the Lord would come upon him and teach him the hard lesson that he would teach him about the greatness of God. Going over, was it chapter 6 or chapter 7? Or was it chapter 4 already? No, it's not 4. Um, what was it? Just not too far after this, though is when the Lord causes Nebuchadnezzar to, to be like the beast of the field there. And it is within that that he learns and, and, and acknowledges the greatness of God. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I really wonder if that was ultimately his, his own pride. Verse oh. 21, chapter 5. Chapter 5 it is. Thank you. 21. Um, thank you. The... Um, I mean, chapter 5 is an interesting chapter because on one hand you got the situation of Belshazzar and the great feast and the writing on the wall there. And um, actually that's that particular story there where Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, learns the lesson the hard way as well. I may be, let's see. Let's see. In uh, 34, no. Nebuchadnezzar's praising God, so I think uh, his lesson would have been uh, before that. Chapter 4, actually, chapter it's, it's kind of broken up. Chapter 4 has to do with uh, a, a message that the Lord is sending Nebuchadnezzar there. And um, let me see here real quick. Of the same chapter? Okay. That's where he's recounting it. And then in thir uh, beginning of 34, he praises God. So he did learn a lesson. He may not have remembered it very long. Uh, chapter 4, 34. Right. Now, what I'm looking at, though, and that's exactly right, that's where Nebuchadnezzar is recounting what happened. Chapter 4 is basically it's a beautiful chapter where Nebuchadnezzar to all peoples and nations and languages that dwell in, the, uh, in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Then he says, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. And chapter 4 is where he's telling about what God did to him mm -hmm. 
to prove to Nebuchadnezzar. And so that's, that, you're right, that's the record of it. That, that's where Nebuchadnezzar is sharing it with the people there. So I really believe, and it's interesting that this falls right on the heels of chapter 3, the way it's laid out for us. This may tie it directly to the very reasoning why God did this, because Nebuchadnezzar was elevating himself, you know, there in that respect. All right, any other thoughts or comments? Thank you for helping me. Because I forget that that's actually not in a, it's not in the story itself is where Daniel's saying that this is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. It's actually Nebuchadnezzar saying this is what happened to me. It's a very beautiful <coughs> uh, lesson there learned. All right, any other thoughts? All right, let's see. All right, let's bring our, start our reading up again to verse 19. And Dell, if you would, let's read uh, verses 19 and let's just read 19 through 20, please. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Keep going. To 23, please. Oh, 23. Yeah. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Okay. Back up to verse 19 here for just a moment. <coughs> Now, notice here it says that Nebuchadnezzar was full of what? <laughs> full of fury. Now, based on our conversations, and again, we're going to speculate just a little bit here with this. His fury was not established in the fact that they were rejecting some all-revered god of the Babylonians or the Chaldeans. Do you think that his fury was simply the fact that they were disobeying him? We speculated a little bit last week that since they, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were given positions of authority and over certain areas there, that here we have three men who were disobeying the king, and this disobedience would probably be made known. The Chaldeans knew it. The, the wise men of the Chaldeans there were aware of it. So it could be that the way Nebuchadnezzar saw this is that they weren't so much rejecting his command but rejecting his authority and unwilling to obey him. And so as a result of that, we see that he was full of fury. And his anger was so great that 19, what happened to his face? Yeah, his, his, his countenance changed. His, his expression on his face changed. <coughs> you, you kind of imagine looking at him, he starts, he starts to turn red in the face. You know, his ears start to grow really red. And, you know, and his, his, he starts scowling at them. And you just see the anger building up within him. So great it was. And it was towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So what did he command regarding the, the, the furnace, the fire in the furnace? Keep it seven times hotter than it. Yeah. <laughs> More than likely, it's, it's not that they had a, a handy-dandy thermostat there and said, we're going to go from, you know, 200 degrees to 1,400 degrees. But more the idea of you get it as hot as you can. <laughs> and you stoke the furnace as hot as you possibly can. Um, and so they did that. They did that. Look at there in verse 20 there. He commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Just lob them in there. And notice how they bound them up in verse 21. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It <laughs> makes no sense. <laughs> you don't want them to be cold. Uh, bound them in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and other garments. Why do you think that's the case? God's will, really. I mean, it, it was going to... You think it prove, protected them? It was going to prove something oh, okay. in, the, in the after okay. text. Yeah. All right, that's an interesting point. They would come out. It was going right. to prove something all right. mm -hmm. important. Bound them and all of that so that they would not be able to uh, resist. Okay, that's an interesting point, where they would, they would be able to struggle against the men who were throwing them in there. Okay, uh, 
Because that makes foolish our sensibility. Yeah. It, like like Dale was talking about, they were bound to be, well, how silly. You know, God's going to prove something to them. Okay. Your story is not going to be worth much. And I'll prove uh, That's possible. Prove they'd come out unscathed. Yeah. Dan? I might have made a, a bigger spectacle for the people observing their punishment because they would have burned longer with all this other uh, flammable material on them. It could be that it was for the spectacle of the furnace uh, punishment. You could have seen them burning in there better with all these uh, <coughs> flammable materials on them. Okay, all right. It could be. I'm just speculating. Sure. Mm -hmm. all right. Roger, Jim. I wonder if it's a case where, you know, anything that had, they had worn or belonged to them, he wanted out of his sight. He didn't want anything to do with it ever again. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to see it. He didn't want to, kind of like the idea of when they, you know, raised the dead bones of the uh -huh. false prophets and burned them. You know, they wanted to get rid of anything that had to do with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts? Gene? You know, the, uh, I, think, I think the Jews wore certain kinds of clothes. Mm hmm Nebuchadnezzar's idea to completely destroy everything which would identify them as Jews, and that was a message then, then to the Jews. Mm -hmm. To all the Jews. Yeah. I kind of, I, what I thought about was actually two of those ones, or two of the, the suggestions that have been put forth. <laughs> One suggestion, and this just doesn't bode well, doesn't say well of, of my mindset, but um, they would burn longer and it would be more uh, torturous on them with the clothes on them. Because uh, clothes burning and everything. But I wonder, though, if the second thing is that it had to do with the association. You know, not just throwing them in the fire, but everything associated with them that would identify them as, um, you know, Jews, the, the, the wise men there that, that he had picked. Just because it lists their turban, their, their coats, their trousers, um, everything thrown in there. So, and we don't know, but it's interesting speculations on that. Maybe they were just wearing those clothes anyway. I mean, he didn't expect, he didn't say go home and get all this stuff on and then I'm going to burn it. <laughs> well, I mean, well it, it's interesting because the way he reads it, bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, that would be the normal stuff I would gather, okay? Mm -hmm. But then there are other garments. So I don't know. We, we, there could have been something else they would throw around them. They could have, because they were wise men of the king, Maybe because they were leaders of uh, uh, certain nations, maybe, uh, or areas, maybe they were required to wear certain ceremonial garments, you know, robes or something like that. We just don't know. But uh, different ideas about that, of course. But it, it, to you and I, it just, in one ha on one hand, it doesn't make sense. But then on the other hand, it makes perfect sense. Just throw them in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With this furnace being heated seven times, Really? Which says a lot. Yes, ma'am. Did the flames consume the people who threw them in? It did. It sure did. Matter of fact, as soon as they opened it up to throw them in, the flames <laughs> leaped out there. And, yeah. Um, Sorry, I have a warped sense of humor. I've you seen. Uh, see yeah. I've seen a, lo a mm -hmm. lot of programs on TV that that have uh, uh, where they melt down large amounts of uh, metal. Yeah. To, uh, in foundries and stuff, and the people who are testing the fire, uh, they have these 18 foot long uh, rods that they use to go up there and, and open the doors and test these fires, and they're in complete fire suits, and uh, the fires sometimes melted the face mask of the people who, who are uh, opening and closing these little doors. and. Uh, to know that this furnace was that hot yeah. is amazing because we're using all kinds of technology to get the, those uh, foundries to that temperature. Yeah, <laughs> and they had smelting processes back then, yeah, right. so I mean they, they had heat. They knew how to get a stove hot enough to melt metals, mm -hmm. you know, and so. so. I think there's another lesson here in, in, in where the three men said, our God will protect us. But all these clothes, all these other garments, there was not a single smell of 
fire or heat or smoke or any of them anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And if, even if you escape the fire, there'll be some some smell on your clothes. That's right. Yeah. And there was nothing there. Not even the hair of their head would stand. So uh, God, here's another lesson to Nebuchadnezzar about the power of God in saving these three men absolutely. There was nothing he could do That's to right. change that. He took control of the laws of nature and laws of yeah. physics and just laid them aside for a little bit. He, made a, he really made a fool out of them. Yeah, <laughs> well, he did. I mean, when you think about with um, Elijah and, and the, the, the battle or the, the fight at Mount Carmel, <coughs> you know, where they, he had them to drench the <coughs> altar in water, you know, and just, mm -hmm. I was going to say buckets, but it was barrels of water, barrels. yeah. And uh, they still lit up. It burned the water. It did, that's right. It and, burned the water. And burned the rock. Yeah. So it, just, it shows God's full control over all things that we don't understand. And that's also a humorous thing. I mean, Pat's uh, enjoying some of the calamity here. Uh, <laughs> it makes a pretty good picture. Right, it does. <laughs> and, and, but I remember the altar was the funniest, some of the funniest lines in the Bible. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's on vacation. <laughs> that's true. Mark had to be chuckling a little bit. That was, that was so God good. God has a great sense of humor. He's <laughs> gone on a trip. All right. <laughs> Let's see. All right, so verse 22, we see the ones killed who, who were, as was pointed out already, who was taken up, or took the men up. And then these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, one time I said Billy Goat years ago. <laughs> Haven't done it since, hopefully not. Anyway, they fell down bound in the midst of the burning fire and furnace. So it says they were bound. You know, implies, I understand they'd be tied up, you know, so... Uh, which makes what they're about to see even more astonishing, mm -hmm. you know. So, any thoughts or comments about that? All right, let's see. Rhonda, let's start with you, and if you would read for us 24 and 25, please. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Okay. All right, let's talk about this for just a few minutes here with this now. So, he was astonished. Imagine, here's, now first off, they've got to have some means of looking into the furnace. Now, now very seriously, he would have had a glass opening, as we would know of, but some sort of portal, some sort of hole that they could see inside there. And so, apparently he saw something that caught his attention. And he was astonished, verse 24 says. And so he rose up in haste, he spoke to his counselors, and you kind of imagine that, you know. Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they said, well, sure, we did, King. So, well, then how come I see four? <laughs> and not only just four, but I see four in there walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt. And the fourth, the form, is like the Son of God. It's amazing. It's literally amazing. And so, again, th these are one of those, those very unique situations in world history where an individual sees something that is beyond comprehension, something they'll never see again that will just shake their belief to the very foundation of who they are. And this is what happens to him. Any thoughts? Gene? What made him think <laughs> that the fourth was like the Son of God? Well, let's talk about that for a moment there. Um, the King James and the New King James renders it capital S as in Son of God. Okay. Um, if you look in some other translations, and let me call a couple of those up here real quick. Let's look, starting with the American Standard Version. It renders it, and I'll share this with those watching on the Internet. Notice he says there in verse 25, and the aspect of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Okay. Um, and then the English Standard Version will render it about the same. It's like a son of the gods, and that's the only ones we really need to look at. What's it, contemporary English? And the fourth one looks like a god. I don't really like that translation, though, period. But anyway. Go down to the 28th verse of chapter 3. The 28th verse? Yeah, here Nebuchadnezzar calls him an angel. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel. Okay, now let's look at that one. That's a good good point there. 
Again, the other translations don't capitalize the angel portion. Um, let's see. Who sent his angel to deliver the servants? Okay. The idea was that it was something in a form that was so bright and glorious that King Nebuchadnezzar had never seen anything such as this before. Yes. It, it wasn't the case of point where the king was looking at this and said, oh, there's, there's Jesus Christ. Right. Or there's the Son of God, as we understand the Son of God. Um, His vision outglowed the fire. Yeah, and so yes. it, some, some deity. Yeah. You know, some divinity. Yeah, divinity. Isn't it possible that he could have been um, <clears throat> inspired to say that, even though he didn't understand what he was I think if he, if that was the case, the original text would have indicated it. I think it has to do with the wording in the Hebrew and the Chaldeans that this is recorded in. Lansing. Does it to comport with uh, the New Testament statement that uh, the gospel uh, was, uh, was a mystery and hidden in ancient times? Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's no way, no way that Nebuchadnezzar could have had any concept Jesus yeah. But that's what yeah. I was saying. And this is kind of an inspiration for well, us now. Unless he was inspired to say that. But the New Testament says that these things were hidden. Yeah. Uh, for it, him. Even, well, even, even like, uh, <clears throat> even in the writings of Isaiah and, and Joel, there's not much talk, if any, and I may, I may be neglecting one. That refers to, to the coming of the Son of God. We have the coming of the Messiah and the one that would suffer in Isaiah 53. But in this case, point Nebuchadnezzar, I think all, he, all his observation was is that he saw some great being. He saw a fourth body in there, and that fourth body, there was something about it that, that, made, that told Nebuchadnezzar that it wasn't a normal person. And so he drew the conclusion that it must be the son of of a, of, a, of a god or of, of gods. Well, um, you know, he confirmed that only three were put in there. So yes. the assumption was that this had to be uh, this had to be uh, someone who came or that appeared there through uh, miraculous powers yeah. of God. Now, and, but understand, this is from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective. Yeah. You know, someone who was a polytheist, you know, who didn't hold to the same stout worship of Jehovah as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So he's explaining it in his own terminology that he best can possibly understand it. Yeah. Um, any, any other thoughts about that, though? Well, we know that Jesus was a um, strong deliverer and yeah. that he did deliver this remnant throughout the Old Testament. There was, he was right. always there. He was just like a pillar of fire before yeah. the children of Israel. Well, now, let's make sure we understand something, though. We know that, that God had a hand in this, you know, clearly. We're talking about just from Nebuchadnezzar's pr perspective, you know. We, this, this could have been uh, the angel of God, you know. This could have been I any of the angels. I it is. Well, no, <laughs> what, 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 well, yeah, the angel of God that's well, appeared. Christ was called that. It, it is in capital letters many times in the Bible where the Christ, our Savior, worked to get our salvation, even in the Old Testament through. There's, right, there's... He, he delivered his, his remnant at all times, yeah. and many times. And there's... Ba Balaam. Well, and there's, the and there's a lot to kind of hold that position, that, that any time you see the angel of, the, of God in the Old Testament, that it was Christ working, you know. But that may or may not have been, but what we do know for certain that it was from God. It, it, it was an angel, it was Michael the Arch... Whoever. Gabriel. No, we we don't know who it was. Capital letters capitalized. Yeah. But the well, capital. I understand too what you're going to say. Yeah. yeah. It, it's the, <laughs> God, yeah, God I, didn't print it. Know. It's trans. He wasn't on the time letter. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I understand it. I'll yeah. be quiet. <laughs> but now what we're about to read, though, Nebuchadnezzar's understanding is that he's about saying here in a little bit that 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 the God of the Jews sent a messenger, sent an angel, sent something to deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we know that it was clearly from God. We have an understanding that he didn't have at that right. time. I have an interesting 
footnote. <clears throat> Since the fourth person may have been the pre-incarnate Christ, who often appears in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. That's what Pat was talking about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's the way I, that's what I hold, but footnote. I understand that it doesn't have to be that way, but I'll still believe it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think you're getting in trouble for believing it. I don't think so. <laughs> All right, let's see. <laughs> um, that's maybe one of the things that uh, we will be enlightened on later on. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I'll just have a trip. <laughs> Gene. Clearly, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar called for the tree to come out, mm -hmm. Judge the fourth didn't. That's right. That's a good point. <clears throat> that's a very good point. The fourth one didn't come out, it was just the three. That's right. Yeah. And Nebuchadnezzar didn't ask for that fourth one to come out either. <laughs> 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 he just called the three to come out. Yeah. <laughs> he stopped his uh, authority. That's <laughs> not okay. anymore. I'm not going to be bossing him around. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's read a little bit more. And I have forgotten your name. I apologize. Would you like to read? Gene. Gene. Yes, ma'am. Would you read verses uh, 26 and... I'll just take us to the end of the chapter there, if you don't mind. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning of fire furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most Highest God, come forth and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth from the midst of the fire, and the princes, governors, and captains, and king's houses, <coughs> being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head, sign neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and has changed the king's word and yield their bodies that they might nor serve, nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything <coughs> amiss against the god of Shamrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their house shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other god that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shamrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Thank you, Miss Jean. You're uh, all right, let's step back up here for just a moment now to verse uh, 26 there. There we go. Now, I want you to observe a couple of things here. The first thing that we notice when we look at this is that, as, as, as I already been pointed out a while ago, he goes to the mouth of the fiery furnace, and he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. You know, he recognizes this point. That the same lesson that he, he received with Daniel is that while he, he's still polytheistic, he recognizes and is reminded of quite strongly here that the God of the Jews is the Most High God. Now, he is the only God. We know that. But Nebuchadnezzar wasn't of this understanding yet. But he did recognize that he is the Most High high God above all others there. And as was pointed out, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, just the three, came out from the midst of the fire. I would have liked to have seen that. You know, Hollywood has done some scenes like that through the years where someone's walking out of the fire and they're not harmed. But imagine seeing that in real life. You know, just, just nothing, you know. Even soaking their clothes in water would not have yielded that effect, you know. I mean, there's just, it, this truly is a miraculous event. That's right. That's an excellent point. The same heat that destroyed them, and they weren't even in the fire, yeah. did not kill the three. Yeah. This is an amazing God to them that can absolutely quench fire. Yeah. It's, a, it's unbelievable that the smell of the fire, that's a big point. I mean, Gene brought it up a while ago, but if you've ever smoked meat and been around, uh, if, you, if you've been around the fire that you used to smoke meat with, you have to change clothes. You can't. Well, it's, like sitting around around a, it's like sitting around a campfire. It's exactly. I mean, you know, and you're not in it. 
you're just around it and the smoke blows across you, it gets in your clothes. <laughs> you know, here's, here's the thing we think about it. If you take somebody from the 12th century and you were to drop them in the classroom right here and we go and we hit that one switch and all the lights come on, it, it would amaze them because of the lack of knowledge. God's control over the very, uh, all the way down to the atomic level of all things. All he's got to do is exercise just a little bit of control and fire no longer burns. Water, you know, you can walk on the water. Uh, you, can, you can stop a river flow with the wind. I mean, just so many things. And all he's got to do is just that. And the rules stop, you know. You could be falling from an airplane, and if God chose to do that, you're, you're no longer falling. You know, and, and, and the point is, is that we don't understand that. It's hard for us to comprehend, but he witnessed something firsthand which showed him that power. You know, you say we can't understand it, which is correct. We can't explain it, we can't understand it, but it makes perfect sense. He set everything in motion. Yes. He, he, caused, uh, he caused all of nature to follow a certain pattern that he established long ago. Yeah. And anything outside of nature is a miracle. And he's the only one that can do that. That's and true. we truly accept. That's it. That's what we do. We don't understand. We accept it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Notice the demeanor of Nebuchadnezzar in verse 26. Mm -hmm. Remember now, prior to this, he was enraged. True. <laughs> now the verse says that he spoke or spake, some translations say, which and, and the next line, servant to the most high God. Uh, he has just made it humbled himself in the sight of God yeah. and confessed that this is the most high God. That's a good point. He, he stated that not acknowledgement, his belief in it. He had no other choice. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and really what he saw probably outweighed any of the um, plagues that came upon Pharaoh as far as in, in the impact that it would have. You know, I mean, Pharaoh, God showed Pharaoh his power over all the Egyptian gods and his power over Pharaoh. Here, he showed them his power over the very nature of all things. Yeah, because uh, most of the plagues that uh, released the children of Israel from the, uh, from the land of Egypt uh, uh, ha have been explained away by uh, land, uh, man's limited knowledge of God, but they've been explained away by natural things. Oh, there was a plague of grasshoppers. You know. Yeah. You know, that, that's, a, that's a natural thing. The wind blew in a bunch of grasshoppers. Or the flies were bad. Or, you know, there, something got in the water and turned it to blood. One theory on the firstborn was a, a release of underground gases. That the firstborn would sleep on the lower level, and so they would be the ones exposed to it. That's, that's why your point is well taken. This goes against the laws of nature. Yeah. Uh, all of those other plagues kind of kind of used nature. Right. In in the plagues of uh, except for God death, used the nature to born, yeah. of course, but uh, uh, that was the final the yeah. final straw. But they didn't have the technology back then to do what these guys did. No. I mean, there's no way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Miss Pat. No. Uh, we just went through what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> As a, as a teacher, you hate it when that happens because, you know, you got to hush up and go on. So, <laughs> Okay, any other thoughts about that? Now, let's look at verse 27 there. All right, so you, you have all of his administrators there, all of his counselors, they all gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. And as was already pointed out a little ago, clear description, the hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. And one thing I hate about grilling out, I love, I love to grill out. I'm not as good as Dell and others are. But uh, you put the hamburger on there, and it's dripping a little bit, so it's flaming up. And you go, if you don't have a long spatula, when you try to flip the hamburger, you will curl some hair on the back of your hand. <laughs> it just happens. And you smell it. <laughs> you know, and so I'm, I'm, I'm only maybe six inches away from the flame, just quick enough, and it's seared. can't even imagine this. I mean, there should have been nothing left of these men, but it's been pointed out, the hair wasn't even singed. Garments weren't affected. Not even, as was said well ago, the smell of fire. See, here's what's significant about that verse. The heathens always claimed that their priests could walk on coals of fire and mm -hmm. not be burned. Yeah, that's an interesting point. 
the fact that these Jews could overcome something that their priests could barely do in, in the claims. That's a good point. Any thoughts? Gene? Yeah, coming back to you, <laughs> interesting. The Dale's comment about what some of them believed. If you look back in the Proverbs, the uh, sixth chapter, when uh, the writer is telling the young man what to be aware of, <clears throat> he says in verse 27, Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? <laughs> so that, yeah. that denies that particular aspect of it, even though there, there were priests that held that way they could walk on coals. Yeah. But uh, through in the Proverbs, the writer there makes the point that you know, mm -hmm. Well, this, this is common sense stuff. You know, if you, if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. I mean, it's just, it will burn. And for something to go contrary to that truly is a miracle. That's a good point there, Gene, with that. Um, all right, any other thoughts? All right, let's look at the next verse here. Let's see. And their observations that they weren't singed, nothing was wrong with them. Nebuchadnezzar then spoke in 28, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. All right, so this kind of goes back to what Dale was Satan, Satan, saying. Sorry. Satan, he called me Satan. <laughs> well, it sounded like it, didn't it? What Dale was saying just a minute ago here, that he acknowledged that, that the god of the Jews sent his messenger. And the angel, the term angel oftentimes can be rendered as messenger, as a messenger of God. All right, and he delivered his servants because he trusted in him. But he also acknowledged something else. They frustrated the king's word. Okay? They, they basically took all, all power of the king away. Because basically the king says, because you're not going to obey me, I'm going to throw you into the furnace. And then, what did he say? Then let's, let's see if your God or whose God will deliver you then. Um, and so when they came out of the fire, their punishment was was averted. They weren't punished for disobedience, so therefore the very word of the king was frustrated and yielded their bodies, that is, gave them back from the fire that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Again, he still believes in multiple gods, but from their mindset, he's just, he's seen the evidence that proves that these guys, they will not worship any god but their own. Robin? I just think, um, English Standard Version reads it as he trusted in him, setting aside the king's command and yielding up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own true god. Setting aside the king's command. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the word frustrated. Mm -hmm. yeah. frustrated. Right. That's a good point there. I just love this decree. He still thinks he's in charge. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. like a decree. Everybody's got to worship this guy. Yeah, that's true. He still that's... thinks he's in charge. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, matter of fact, let's look at that there in verse 29 there. You're right. He says, therefore, I make a decree. <laughs> um, well, let's read this for a moment. That any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be, he likes this. He likes cutting pieces. He does. <laughs> shall be cut in pieces. Their houses shall be made an ash heap because there are a dunghill. Some translations because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Remember when he called for the wise men to tell me my dream? And if he can't do it, I'm going to cut you up <laughs> and so he can turn the ash heap there. So nowhere in that verse are they suggesting he's telling his people that they have to worship him. No. True. He's saying he can't speak anything, can't speak anything against him. Yeah, that's a very good yeah. point there. He's not binding worship. He's forbidding uh, a blasphemy right. against the God there. That's a good point. Yes, Gene. In his, um, in his comment, Nebuchadnezzar said something, and then we get back to it. Um, oh, yeah, verse 28. He had delivered his servants who trusted in him, who had frustrated the king's word, and yielded their bodies. Look at Romans 12. <laughs> what are we supposed to do? Living wow. sacrifices. Yeah. As bodies, a living sacrifice. <laughs> That's true. Yield our bodies, present our bodies a living sacrifice. And in a roundabout way, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, they were a living sacrifice. And in a roundabout way, they were being sacrificed for their belief in God, and God delivered them. 
Not quite the same way as what he's talking about here, but it's, it, it, you know, that's minor similarity there. I, I think he did think that way. He would they would have given their bodies if God had, they would have done it whether God yeah. uh, saved them or not. Saved them or not, physically right. saved them. Well, that, because they said in there, that, yeah. you know, we're going to do this whether, I mean, we're not bowing. That's true. Well, the, the only difference is, is that in, in their case in point, <laughs> in, in Paul's instance right here, He's kind of, uh, t kind of looking back to the sacrifices that Israel offered. And we present ourselves a living sacrifice, continually being offered unto God there. Mm -hmm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego gave their sacrifice their lives. You know, they're willing to. And so we do see a similarity here, a little bit different, but we should be willing to give our lives. We should be willing to present ourselves as a daily sacrifice offered unto God. Some of the well, Christians Paul, did have to give their lives. Right. That's and the right. Apostle Paul... Uh, he kind of uh, uh, had a dilemma about which one to do. To, True. To go and be with Christ or to continue to work. Mm -hmm. And to continue to work is a living sacrifice. That's our, right. Our lives, our conduct, our walk through life, our Christian uh, conversation is uh, service to the Lord. And that is our sacrifice. That's right. Uh, it's not that we're sacrificing the things we want to do because after a while you don't want to do them. But uh, we are uh, giving of ourselves. It would be like uh, people talk about giving, and it always makes them think of their wallet. You know, but giving doesn't always have to do with your, with your wallet. That's it right. has to do with your work for the Lord, too. That's right. In a roundabout way, you might say that Hannah sacrificed Samuel mm -hmm. in that she gave him up for a, a, a life of service unto God, you know. Um, not the same as the story of, um, Samson. no, um, uh, he was yeah, Jephthah. The story of Jephthah where he said, I'll sacrifice the first thing, and it says he offered his daughter. I've heard some people speculate that he didn't really kill the daughter, that he actually gave her to the service of the Lord for the rest of her life, but the Bible doesn't clarify that. You know, but the point is, though, is they were willing to, in like, especially the case of Hannah, here's my child, for life you have him. You I know? wonder what the, this, we're into another study, but I wonder what the sacrifice would be if he gave her into service to the Lord. Did that mean she could not take a husband or marry or uh, service to the Lord in, in what way? I have no idea. That would be my guess. If that was the correct understanding of it, then she would spend her life as a, as a virgin. Because she went to bewail her virginity. Right. Yeah. Um, but this, this goes along to what we were talking about in our Wednesday night Bible class on the cross on discipleship. Mm -hmm. So it's not sacrifice, but it's making a stand and willing to suffer any persecution because we're all going to be persecuted as Christians. Yeah. And, right. and this is what these three men uh, were willing to do. They were willing to be persecuted for a stand uh, with God. That's right. Persecution for their God. That's right. Um, Jean and then yeah, Ms. Maxine. I think, uh, I think what I said didn't, didn't, wasn't Hindu and Jinder all these all these discussions. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, the point I was trying to make was that, that there are lessons in the Old Testament that have parallel lessons in the New Testament. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they're no less important to us than it was then. It's a different kind of a sacrifice, but although we sometimes feel like that sacrificing ourselves to God is just really more than a person could do. Yeah. yeah. But there are there are comparisons between the Old Testament and the New in respect to service to God. Exactly. And I think that's a very good point. That's what that yeah. term schoolmaster means. If it doesn't bring us to mind of the things that were instructed in the in, in the New Testament, uh, then yeah. then it's not a schoolmaster, but it is. It prepared the people and it prepares us. Right. It's Maxine. Oh, well, along with what he was saying, it's the lesson that these three had to trust in God. Yes. Yeah. They, they, they even gave that before they were thrown in there. They, mm -hmm. they did their trust. I mean, they showed their trust there. Yeah. And it, it would be called a win-win. Yeah. If we die, we'll be rewarded. If we don't, <coughs> we'll be saved. You know, it's a win-win. But let's talk about the trust now. For, we've got about a couple minutes here, and we'll, we'll kind of stretch this out. But I want to talk about that trust for a moment. Rhonda. I was going to say, over in Hebrews 11, it's the whole hall of faith there. 
and he comes down and he talks about they stopped them out of the lion. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped into the storm. That quenching the violence of fire, I've always thought, is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. You know, they, it, they, they had such a faith that they, they were able to declare their faith, stand upon their faith, and knew no matter which way, whatever the outcome, they had faith in God. If the outcome was their death, right. they were fine with that. If their outcome was he saved them, they were fine with that. That's because right. of their faith. That's right. Let's talk about this trust for a moment. This, this may gender more discussion than what we really have time for. Um, but, all right. These people throughout the Old Testament, Daniel, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, David up against the Goliath, they all had trust in God. And these guys, their attitude was, if God, is, if God wants to deliver us, he can, without a doubt. And he did. Our trust in God today isn't so much established on the physical possibilities, but the eternal promises, okay? For instance, if, if for whatever reason, if, if, I, if we find ourselves in 40 years from now in a world completely foreign to us where Christianity is deserving of the death penalty, and you find yourself on the firing line or whatever choice of punishment they choose to execute you with there, you can say to yourself, well, I fully believe that if God wants to deliver me from this, he will. But the way God works today, that's not where we put our trust. Our trust is pull the trigger, and I know I'll be in his hands. You know, that's where we put our trust. Now, I'm not saying that God cannot. I'm just saying that the way God works under the new covenant is we see he no longer works that way, where he saves his people from the mouth of lions. But that's not important. What's important is what happens on the other side of our death. And that's where we must put our trust. So, in other words, we're not afraid to die. You know, we, we may say, Lord, you know, please you know, spare me from this so that I can take care of my family and things like that. But in the end, we fully trust him to catch us. We, we as don't it were. control the providence of God. We don't, we don't yeah. control what he will do for us in this life. Right. We, but we do know that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He tells us that. He tells us to pray for the sick. He tells us to, to use prayer. Now, we don't put ourselves in God's place and say, uh, my aunt told me one time, she said, just let me know and I'll pray that that oil gets moved under the oil well you invested in. <laughs> I, I said, well, I, you know, I don't even want to go there. I don't, don't tell God to make me rich because he's already told me that it's going to be hard for me to be a Christian yeah. if I am rich. So, you know, but we don't control God's, his area that he, that yeah. he acts on us. And, I, and it's, a, it's kind of a, an area where we can't explain it. Prayer, in my way of thinking, it avails much. Sure. Mm -hmm. It puts us in a humble situation where we're putting him above us, and we're subordinate to him, and we're asking him for stuff. Now, whether or not he answers in the affirmative or the negative, it, that's his problem. That's, yeah. what, that's where we can't. Uh, we can't control God by prayer. Right. But we need to pray. We need it's, it. It's, it's kind of like a Christian that chooses for whatever reason to take up parachuting. And I've seen it work. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've seen him answer yes. Yeah. So, so don't get me wrong. I yeah. believe in prayer. But, yeah. But I think it's as much for us to be in a humble, asking... Uh, Our tr uh, faith in him. Faith in him. Yeah, that's right. That's right. If, if you're plummeting to the earth and your parachute fails... You can pray to God all you want to that maybe something will, 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 hit, will stop your fall. But if you're a child of God, just pray also that he'll catch you. And I don't mean in the physical sense. Yeah. You know, just, and, um, but my point is, and that, that's, that's the thing about trust. Our trust in God is to catch us on the other side when we die. We know he'll take care of us. He'll pro may provide for all our provisions. But I've known too many Christians that have died, you know, from things that, it just, if God had wanted to stop, he could have. Well, but it wasn't within his will and his work. Exactly. And, we, and you know, aren't, aren't we selfish to want our fellow Christians to stay with us forever? It, uh, you know, it, we're supposed to be. We're supposed to cry for people that we lose, and, and we're supposed to love them around us and, be, and want to be with them. But 
you know, it may be best for them to go on and be with God. Well, my, my fear of dying is, and I, I, I'll tell you, my fear of dying is this, is that I'll die early, Ron will be mad at me, and then when she dies, I'll have to deal with her in heaven. <laughs> that's, that's my... Well, we won't be taking a marriage, but... I know, what, I know what you're talking about. Lucky for him. Betty, you had your hand up. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. like Dan said, it's a win-win thing for us Christians. That's right. We look forward to heaven, and that will be our glory. Right. Yeah. But right now, if we're Christians, we can have a better life here on earth. Yeah, that's right. Much better. That's right. Okay. We're faithful Christians. Death should never be feared. That's right. Absolutely. I, yeah. In fact, death should be looked forward to. It's funny about this this particular yeah. lesson. The biggest fear I have is fire. <laughs> yeah. no, I, fire. I think I'd rather die any other way than by fire. Yeah. It's just it's too that's hot for me. Trial. It's just too hot for yeah. me. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, verse 30, the king promoted again Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay. Next Tuesday, we'll start with the questions for lesson number three. So it's good to have everyone with us here today. We've gone a few minutes past. We're going to pull the lesson to a close. We appreciate those who have been uh, watching via the Internet. Remember, tonight at 730 at scripturalway.org, we'll have our Scriptural Way Bible study with Dell and I. John won't be able to make it this evening, so just be focused on Dell and I. <laughs> anyway, we do have a live chat room where you can participate in this study with that as well. Um, Gene, would you mind dismissing us in a word of prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, we pray thy continued blessings on us as we study thy word and learn how we may better serve thee in this life by understanding the examples of how thy people have trusted thee in days gone by. We pray, Father, that thou be with us, that would forgive our sins, save us if we are found faithful to thee. In the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Is that your